Let's, um, let's turn to Exodus chapter 4, and we'll look at verse 22 and 23 again. <clears throat> Exodus 4, verse 22 and 23. <clears throat> and thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I will say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. <clears throat> so most of us are familiar um, with the Exodus in chapter 4 and all the way through uh, verse or chapter 13. And um, Israel was in bondage down in Egypt. And they were there for 400 years. And then the Lord comes down and moves on. Moses and tells him to go stand before Pharaoh. <clears throat> and the first words that he told him to say were these words right here. This was before he even got to Egypt. This was as he was preparing to leave Jethro and his family that was out in the wilderness to go do this. And the Lord spoke to him. And he said, say to Pharaoh, let my son go um, Israel is my son even my firstborn and I say unto thee let my son go that he may serve me and so he also says within these verses that um, if you do not let them go then uh, I will slay your firstborn so after the first nine plagues which were all miracles and none of those miracles delivered Israel out of Egypt. The final plague wasn't a plague at all. It was the death of the lamb. <clears throat> and the Lord said that for, for everyone of Israel to slay a lamb and put its blood on the doorpost, and the blood will be a token to the death angel that passes by will be a token that the people in this house have eaten that lamb, have killed it and eaten it. And it represents Christ crucified. Put it on the inside of them <clears throat> and he will pass over and everyone who doesn't do that, their firstborn will die. So that would be that anybody in Israel that said, oh, that won't work because miracles didn't work. Uh, and they didn't do it, then their firstborn would have died. Okay. Uh, if any Egyptian had have done it, their firstborn would have lived. So, we, from that concept, um, the Lord has shown us something that <clears throat> coming out of Egypt, there were two groups. There were two groups. They were Israel, the people of God, and there were the firstborn who were not killed, who were redeemed. And the lamb was slain to save the firstborn, not Israel, um, to save them for God so that they could serve God. And we'll get into that a little more. But um, uh, so only the firstborn would have died. If nobody put blood, nobody killed the lamb, nobody ate the lamb, nobody put its blood on the doorpost, everybody's firstborn would have died. But not everybody would have died. Okay. So two groups. Israel, who was in bondage, were freed from bondage. And the redeemed by the lamb firstborn because it was the firstborn of every family who was redeemed well before God even said that I mean he, he says it here 
in chapter 4. So this is way early than the events that took place standing before Pharaoh. And he's already bringing up, or I will slay thy, first, thy son, even thy firstborn. And he says, let my son go, even my firstborn. And we decided that that maybe just didn't apply to Egypt, let my son go, which would only be the firstborn, um, that they may serve me, but that, um, that that didn't apply in the redeeming sense of the death of the lamb to all the rest of Egypt. They were literally delivered from bondage but they were not redeemed by the death of the lamb. The death of the lamb only died so that the firstborn would live because they would have died in place of, uh, well, the truth is the lamb that they slew and, you know, put its blood, put, first of all, put their life in there and then put its blood on there. That's the one, that's the innocent one that redeemed all the firstborn. And that was the firstborn that was on the inside of that. They put that firstborn lamb on the inside of that. So God is saying to us and was saying to them, you have my son, my firstborn in you, and I'm saying unto you, quit acting like Pharaoh, let him go. <laughs> you, when you got born again, have my firstborn son in you. And I say unto you, so he's still saying the same thing because he still wants his firstborn son, Jesus, the lamb that was in them, the lamb that was slain but was taken on the inside. I want him. And so he's only saying that again in, in uh, Exodus to those who are redeemed firstborn. And everyone else is just being delivered from bondage. The thing that delivered them from bondage wasn't any of the miracles either, and it wasn't even the death of the lamb. It was the fact that their firstborn, the Egyptian firstborn, died, and that's when Pharaoh said, okay, y'all can go. Israel can go. But the firstborn are not going from Egypt. In this scripture here, He's calling his firstborn out of Egypt unto himself. The father is calling his son unto himself. Okay. So, I want to talk a little bit about the, the feast of Passover because this whole event was the first feast of Passover and it was something that God said, you shall commemorate this, you shall memorialize this, it shall be a memorial to you throughout all generations this thing that happened in the Exodus in Egypt. And so there is that which is near to the Lord's heart that he wants commemorated, and it's even brought up in the New Testament that Christ, our Passover, has died for us. So it's still being commemorated, hopefully, <laughs> in the true spirit of what was meant. All right, so let's go to Exodus 5 now, and we'll go through several scriptures in Exodus. <clears throat> and afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Okay, so there is a, there is a feast that is planned, but what we're going to discover is, and what we've discovered in the story of the prodigal son is, the feast didn't happen with the elder son. The feast, he was, he was the firstborn, but he didn't act like the firstborn. It was the younger son who came back, and he was the prodigal, and he'd messed up and everything, but he saw in the father's eyes that he was being treated more than a repentant mess up, that the father was looking at him, was putting the best ring, the best robe, the best everything on him, and was saying, my firstborn son is in you. And then the father takes that son and he goes over to the altar with the fatted calf and kills it, 
opens it up, takes the parts out, shows it to the son, says, this is us, this is our family, this is who we are. And, and the father's just thrilled that he's got a son that is, as it were, going to let his firstborn son go. And then the prodigal, he's no longer a prodigal. Good grief, we're half over with the prodigal is, already, is, is like looking at this, and he's looking at the father's heart in relationship to the sacrifice and in relationship to his, his relationship to that. And he's thinking, I never was that to my father, but I will be now. And he sees all of that. And so the father says, okay, so this is the explanation. Now we need to move beyond explanation. Let's eat it. And they ate the sacrifice, and they had a big feast. And that's where the, the elder son got upset because he didn't want to go in to the feast. Well, this feast is the feast of the sacrifice of the slain lamb, as it were, the feast of that. And it's not just being delivered from bondage like the prodigal was. See how this was matching up with Exodus. He wasn't just delivered from bondage. He came unto the Father. Remember, let my son go unto me that he may come out unto me and feast with me. So the prodigal son is entering into letting the son that was in him go. All right? So, um, and, the, and this verse says a, that they may hold a feast unto me, a feast unto me. Now that's so significant because we make the feast and we make the Passover and we make the, because the, remember the Passover was the same day that we call what? Easter or the day, or certainly our day of deliverance. If that's all it is, is a day of deliverance, then we're just part of Israel coming out of Egypt instead of the firstborn who the lamb was put in them and they understood he wants his firstborn son in here, not me. And Israel saying, he wants me. He just wants to save me. He just wants to deliver me. And the firstborn is going, no, no, no. I should have died, but the lamb died. And then he put that slain lamb inside of me. And this is what he wants out of me. And the father's going, let my firstborn come unto me, okay, not go from Egypt, not delivered from bondage, but come feast with the Father, fellowship with the Father in what he fellowships, like the prodigal son was fellowshipping with the Father over the sacrifice, and they had a big feast over it. All right, so let's go to Exodus 10, 9. Exodus 10, 9, and Moses said, we will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds. We will go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. Okay, so he's still talking to Pharaoh, and, and Moses is saying, we need to go unto the Father. He never said we need to get out of here. He never said that. He said we are going to the Father to have a feast unto him. It is literally both, um, let's see, in, in Exodus 5, 1 said, a feast unto me, because the Lord was talking there. This one says, must hold a feast unto the Lord. This is not unto us. This is unto the Father by the Son who is in us, who is given in us. So, Exodus 12 now. Exodus 12, verse 13 and 14. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord. So whoever celebrated the Passover, whoever celebrated um, 
the death of Christ and the time that he died, how are we celebrating it? Are we celebrating it as a memorial and as a feast unto the Lord? Or are we just Israel who got delivered out of Egypt and we're just celebrating deliverance from bondage, from sin, bondage to sin and all of that instead of the son, the firstborn, being let go to the father. Okay, so he's making a big point here because he, he calls it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast. Well, the feast was what the prodigal son and the father, they were eating the sacrifice, and that's what started the, the party. La fiesta. That's what did it. All right, so let's think about then Israel. Okay, so coming out of Egypt, you have Israel. And you have the firstborn. So let's look at that. Is this feast a feast of rejoicing over deliverance? No, it shouldn't be. It should be a feast of fellowship with the Father over his slain Son, whom we've now put in us. Amen? That's what it should be, All right, okay? But we've made it a feast of rejoicing over our deliverance. Um, um, I put down that it should have been a feast under the father's heart like the prodigal when he came back and he began to acknowledge what the father was acknowledging in here that's my son in you not my failure son not you but my son my firstborn son in you then it was a feast unto the father's heart you see that and it was also uh, I named it this, the Feast of the Firstborn, because that's the feast that pleases the Father's heart. Praise God. All right, so i got three minutes here. Matthew 26, verse 1 through 5. Matthew 26, verse 1 through 5. <clears throat> And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtuity and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar. Okay, so it starts off in verse 1. Jesus says, in two days is the feast of Passover. So it's talking about the same day, the same exact time, way back at Moses' day. And Jesus is entering into that same exact time. And he's entering into that as, like in, in Egypt, there was a lamb that was slain. Well, he's that lamb that's going to be slain. Okay? And... Um, and so he's saying, look, I'm, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be a slaughtered lamb, all right? And so then the, the priests and all that start talking about it, and they said, well, we're going to kill him, okay? But we don't want to do it on the feast day, lest there's an uproar. We wouldn't want an uproar on the feast day. Looks like I'm going to run over a little bit here. All right. So Jesus, when he, when he gave them... The, when they celebrated the Passover, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, I want you to put broken bread into you. Broken bread. Not whole bread. I want, it wasn't, each, each person got a baked whole piece. No, I want broken, I want Christ crucified in you. The original one they said, I want, God said, I want you to kill that lamb and I want you to put it on the inside of you. I want slain lamb on the inside of you. 
the same one in the book of Revelation that's reigning on a throne, the slaughtered lamb. All right? So that's what we eat. That's our communion. Most of the time when you hear communion, people are talking about, well, you know, it's all about sin and we've been redeemed from sin and we're approaching it exactly like Israel, not like the firstborn given the Father. We're putting this, we're putting this in us and we're going to give you your firstborn back. Okay? So, they said... Uh, well, we don't want to do this on the feast day lest there be an uproar, right? All right, look at the next verse, verse uh, 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment poured it on his head as he sat at meat. And when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? Notice that both of these things took place place two days before the Passover Jesus is saying in two days I'm going to be offered up as the Passover lamb okay and the very next thing that it mentions is there's going to be a feast she comes in there she's pouring on him she's, she's fellowshipping in his death because she did it for his burial not for her to be redeemed from sins and it's a completely different spirit so also in this scripture, though, there, is a, there ends up being an uproar. We read it. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this feast, if you will? What's the purpose of this? I don't see it. No, of course you don't. Israel's not going to understand what the firstborn will understand. Those who are given to that sacrifice, because they put the sacrifice on the inside of them, understand what they're for. That lamb died for them, redeemed them from death. That lamb in Exodus didn't die for all the people, only died for the firstborn. That's right. It's undeniable. So these are the ones who understand he wants the firstborn. He wants the firstborn. And the disciples are making an uproar on the feast day. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. One little longer. We'll come back in a few minutes.